I just want to thank everybody for being here today for our program, The Future is Female and So Was the Past. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Carrie Curry. I'm the historical coordinator at the Burwell School, and we are just thrilled to be offering this presentation. Um, it was part of a live program that we had hoped to have, but in this world of COVID, um, we are so thankful to our presenter who was willing to transition to Zoom. Um, so, Laura, I'm going to turn it over in just a minute to Janie Morris, who's going to introduce Laura, but I just wanted to let everybody know there will be question and answers afterwards. You can send your questions at any time during the presentation into the chat, and I will um, share those with Laura when she's all finished, and we will all learn something fantastic today. So I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to our wonderful chair of the research committee, Janie Morris, and let her tell you just a little bit more about our speaker. Thanks, Laura and Janie. Hello, everyone. I am delighted to introduce Laura Meekham. I first met Laura in 1994 when she was volunteering in the Special Collections Library at Duke. She went on to receive the Master of Library Science degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, School of Information and Library Science. She came back to Duke having served as the head of public services in the Special Collections Department at the Woodruff Library at Emory University. Laura is currently the director of the Sally Bingham Center for Women's History and Culture, part of the David M. Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Duke. The Sally Bingham Center is charged to acquire, preserve, and provide access to published and unpublished materials that reflect the public and private lives of women past and present. Laura is also the curator of gender and sexuality history collections in the Rubenstein Library. Both of these roles involve the identification, appraisal, acquisition, and promotion of materials in almost every format, from rare books and serials to letters, diaries, photographs, ephemera, artifacts, and digital materials. Laura has collaborated with a range of entities within and beyond Duke on projects and programs, such as the feminist art movement and the use of primary source material in elementary and middle school classroom, among others. Some of Laura's major projects include building multifaceted research collections on topics such as the history of reproductive health, the intersection of feminism and the church, and the history and culture of local and regional LGBTQ communities, as well as organizing exhibitions and symposia on themes emerging from these collections. Laura's research interests include the archivist as activist and the complexities of documenting feminist and queer movements. Laura has been recognized by the Association of College and Research Libraries of the American Library Association for her achievement in women and gender studies librarianship. The awards committee selected Laura based on her significant leadership, strengths, and contributions to the world of archives. The committee was impressed with her proactive work with students, how she makes collections come alive for students, and her passion to connect students with archival resources. During her directorship, she has grown both its collections and its national profile. In addition, she has helped countless scholars in the field of women and gender studies. As Carrie Curry has just said, you may ask questions uh, in the chat box if you would like to, and Laura will be glad to answer those questions at the end of her presentation. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Janie, for that incredibly kind, incredibly generous, and beautifully read introduction, and for your enthusiasm and support for this program from the beginning of our conversations about it. Thanks also to Carrie Curry and Kate Dubis for inviting me to be with you today to share an extraordinary women's history collection. I'm sorry that we can't be together at the school, but I hope that we can make the most of our Zoom gathering. I'm so excited to share this extraordinary collection with you today. And 
so I'm going to share my screen. I hope that everybody can see that. The Lisa Unger Baskin Collection is a vast and multifaceted body of material documenting women at work. The collection includes many well-known monuments of women's history and arts, as well as lesser known works produced by female scholars, printers, laborers, scientists, artists, political activists, and many others. Taken together, they comprise a mosaic of the ways that women have been productive, creative, and socially engaged over more than 500 years. Baskin's lifelong passion for collecting and preserving women's history resonates deeply with the mission of the Sally Bingham Center for Women's History and Culture. Her approach to collection building is a kind of activism itself, and in that respect, it shares much in common with the work of the center. The Baskin Collection is the largest collection of women's history material previously in private hands. Comprised of about 18,000 items in all, the core of the collection is U.S. and European books and papers, including over 12,000 published items and more than 250 distinct manuscript collections. The collection is also rich in material culture, offering an extensive array of artifacts from a British suffrage tea set, the most complete known of its kind, to Virginia Woolf's writing desk. The earliest items include a land grant from 1240 for a home for repentant prostitutes in Pisa, and one of the first books known to have been printed by women, dated in 1478. The major strengths and themes of the collection include early printed books, women artists, U.S. and British women's suffrage, abolition, science and medicine, labor, education, and literature. Working with the Lisa Unger Baskin Collection in the context of the Rubenstein Library, conducting research, teaching, making art, doing activism, and creating exhibitions, supports the powerful and provocative assertion first made by 1970s lesbian feminists, and more recently during the 2016 presidential election, that the future is female. The collection makes visible and tangible the labors and achievements of women from every walk of life such as publishers, craftswomen, peace workers, midwives, educators, and businesswomen. And in doing so, challenges our understanding of women's history and contributions. In other words, the past is female, at least as female as it has been assumed to be male. So what does an 18,000 item, 18, item collection look like? The images in this slide and the next are of Lisa's library in her home just before we packed the collection into 600 crates that filled two semi-trucks, which drove nonstop from Leeds, Massachusetts to Durham, North Carolina, and arrived at Duke in April of 2015. It's worth noting that the shelves in Lisa's library are very deep, each one holding two to three rows of books. That's one book in front of another, in front of another. So here is an aerial view of the library. A couple of weeks before the collection was packed, the Rubenstein Library's oral historian, Greg, Craig Braden and I traveled to Leeds to film Lisa in this space discussing her collection. Within a year of arriving at Duke, we presented the first exhibit from the collection entitled, Heralding the Way to a New World, Exploring Women in Science and Medicine through the Lisa Unger Baskin Collection. One of the women whose works we featured is Florence Nightingale, whose 1860 essay, Cassandra, provided the title for the exhibit. Nightingale declared, rather 10 times die in the surf, heralding the way to a new world than stand idly by on the shore. While the first Baskin collection exhibit was located in one room, the, the 2019 exhibit entitled 500 Years of Women's Work, the Lisa Unger Baskin collection, ranged over three rooms and even outside of the Mary Duke Biddle suite. It was the largest exhibit ever presented by the Duke University Libraries, including, as it did, over 270 items. Because of its size and the demand we hoped it would create, we developed a docent program to support weekly guided tours. About a dozen library staff spent several months training and then each volunteered to provide at least two tours. Anyone could sign up the, through the library's website for guided tours, which were provided almost every Friday afternoon of the show. The exhibit attracted thousands of visitors, a number of whom told us that they came back two and three times, often bringing family and friends with them. Today, I hope to offer a version of our gallery tour. Like the tours we gave of the Duke exhibit, I selected a few items in each section to focus on. For the purposes of these slides, offered via Zoom rather than projected onto a screen, I made the images 
of the items as large as I could. And so for that reason, they're not always in proportion to one another. The tour begins here, just outside the Mary Duke Biddle exhibition suite on what was a busy corridor in the Rubenstein Library on Duke's West Campus. The Sperling family exhibit cases positioned on either side of the double doors into the Biddle suite featured a number of eye-catching items from the collection that offered abundant stories, which we hope would draw passers-by into the suite. The tours generally started at this case to the left of the double doors. It featured the exhibit introduction and some of the many striking three-dimensional artifacts in the Baskin collection, such as pieces from the large suffrage and anti-slavery china sets. In the case to the right of the double doors, we have a large-scale facsimile collage presentation of a selection from the hundreds of trade cards, advertisements, and photographs in the Baskin collection, demonstrating the vast array of professions women engaged in and even invented over the course of more than five centuries. And here are some examples, which I often pointed out during my tours. And here they are, just a little bit larger, so that they will hopefully be a little bit more visible to all of you. Number one, it's a trade card for Elizabeth Hare, who was active in, as an instrument maker from around 1730 to 1741. She managed her husband Joseph Hare's music shop from around 1725 and succeeded him in his death. A receipt for the purchase of a, quote, parcel of violin strings is written on the reverse. Elizabeth Hare's name also appears on printed music from about 1735 until her death in 1741. Number two is a metal badge of Madame Baclet, who was a brocanteur, or a dealer of secondhand goods. Many street and pushcart vendors were women who sold a range of goods. This badge was her license to sell legally on Paris streets. The police enforced, enforced the licenses. Vendors without a badge were limited to being, quote, basket women who might quickly slip away when the police drew near. Number three is a portrait of a female firefighter in uniform from around 1870. Number four is a late 19th century trade card of Mrs. Lily Geiger, layer out of the dead of Reading, Pennsylvania. By the way, this profession, now sometimes known as mortician or funeral director, was developed by women. Number five, a photograph of African-American women machinists during World War II. Here are the doors into the Biddle Suite. I believe that this is the first exhibit for which we added text and a design element to these doors. The quote on the left is from Lisa Baskin. It reads, the unifying thread is that women have always been productive and working people and this history essentially has been hidden. The image on the right is a 1637 woodcut by English barrister William Austin, who advocated for legal and public liberties for women. It references Leonardo da Vinci's iconic Vitruvian Man, an image that defined ideal human proportions. Austin replaces the figure with the female body. Though diminutive, the image is monumental in spirit, and it is one of Lisa's favorite image in the entire collection. Inside the Biddle Suite, we arrange the exhibit chronologically, starting with the 1200s to the 1600s, as you see, in the image on the left-hand side of the slide. There were two cases for this time period. I want to note here that while the oldest document in the collection is from the 12th century, the bulk of the collection is from the mid-15th to the mid-20th century, thus 500 years of women's work. In Europe during the early modern period, women worked in a range of jobs and professions from farm wives who helped plant and harvest crops to fishmongers who sold their wares in markets to guildswomen who engaged in skilled labor, as well as artists, scholars, midwives, doctors, prostitutes, and servants. Women participated in almost every corner of the economy. This wide participation was evident throughout Europe, East as well as West, despite the many local and regional differences in how women labored. But notwithstanding the presence of women in all sectors of the economy, Women's work was not understood or valued in the same way as men's work. In contrast, male workers, in contrast to, female, to male workers, female workers saw their ability to pra practice certain trades curtailed and their capabilities were often seen as inferior to those of men. Women were paid less than men and their work was often more contingent, despite the fact that many families relied on the income or work of all of their family members. 
Baskin Collection documents the lives and contributions of an amazing range of entrepreneurial women who found ways to follow their callings during this period to become successful educators, business women, and revolutionaries. Here are just a few examples. The earliest documented printing by women is from the, the press at the convent of San Jacobo de Ripoli in Tuscany in 1478. The nuns set type, sewed folios, and provided financial backing to the press. The collection includes two copies of the pseudo Petrarchan text, for which I've, actually, I've put a detail on this slide. The copy depicts, depicted in this slide is untrimmed with copious marginalia. The manicule, the hand, as you see here, with the pointing finger and the very long arm, points insistently to an entry for the mythic Pope Joan and proclaims Papa Femina. Charlotte Guillard was one of the most eminent of the approximately 50 women printers in the 16th century Paris. She edited and published in Latin, Greek, and French. Married to two printers and twice widowed, she printed under her own name. Guillard was responsible for the printing works, a bookshop, property, and leases. She began printing in 1502 and continued until her death in 1557. A consummate businesswoman and scholar, she printed substantial academic, legal, and religious texts, over 200, over 200 titles in all. The image in this slide, which prominently bears her name, is dated 1539. Number three, here we have a handsome folio of Antonio Augustin's work on antiquities, which is considered the first book to contain illustrations by a woman artist, Geronima Parasole, the powerful Athena, on the title page and the large woodcuts bear various versions of her initials, PM and GAP. The knife next to her signature indicates that she cut as well as drew the blocks. Number four, a book printed and signed in 1695 by Elizabeth Redmayne, who actively printed in London from 1683 to 1706. Women could not legally own print shops, but a widow was permitted to continue the family printing business under her own name until she remarried, occasionally to one of the apprentices in the shop, or until a son came of age. Often successful, many widows flourished as independent businesswomen responsible for operations, finances, and supervision of pressmen and compositors. By the way, the hands in that image belong to our amazing exhibits preparator, Yoon Kim. This image and all of the images in my talk and many more are in the in online version of the exhibit as well as the exhibit catalog. <laughs> Items dated 1700 to 1899 were displayed in this massive 21-foot case, along with another wall hanging case across the room. You might also notice a freestanding case on the left-hand side of the photo on the left. There were three of these in the space, and each featured a different woman's life and work. Women in the 1700s, as well as with the centuries before and after, were challenged with expressing themselves in a patriarchal system that generally refused to grant merit to women's views. Cultural and political events during these centuries increased attention to women's views, issues, such as education reform, and by the end, end of the 18th century, women were increasingly able to speak out against injustices. Many women worked to expose the conditions they faced and improve their lot using a variety of subversive and creative methods. The Bastion Collection is very strong in this period because of Lisa's deep interest in early printed books, as well as her keen desire from early in her collecting to reach back further in women's history to discover what she had not been taught in school. Here are just a few of the items in the collection that focus on 18th century women's education and business acumen. Number one, a 1718 portrait of a pioneering entomologist and artist, Maria Sibylla Marion, next to one of her scientific and artistic creations. Marion was the first person to study and depict the metamorphosis of insects in the field. During her career, she described and illustrated the life cycles of 186 insect species from direct observation by amassing evidence and that contradicted the contemporary notion that insects were, quote, born of mud by spontaneous generation. She taught girls botanical drawing and sold her specimens, prints, and books to earn a living. 
Phyllis Wheatley was the first African American to publish a book and the first American woman to seek to earn a living from her writings. Born in West Africa, she was purchased by Susanna and John Wheatley at the age of seven or eight. Susanna taught her to read and write. Her poems, rejected in Boston, were first published in London, financed by Selina Hastings, Countess of Huntington. They reflect Wheatley's breadth of learning, identity as an African, and life as an enslaved woman. Number three, Dutch immigrant Anne Catherine Hoof Green worked alongside her husband in his Maryland printing business. When he died in 1767, she inherited his bankruptcy debt along with the shop, a pattern repeated in the lives of many women printers, as we've seen. She went on to successfully petition the State Assembly to continue her appointment as public printer to the province of Maryland. Sympathetic to the revolution, she ran a busy shop and post office printing books, pamphlets, almanacs, and colonial currency, of which this is an example. By the way, she paid off the debt. Number four, a portrait of teacher and scientist Margaret Bryan with her students in 1799. Keenly aware that she was venturing into a new sphere for women, Margaret Bryan included mathematics and science in the curriculum to be taught to girls at her schools in Blackheath, London, and Margate. Bryan wrote on physics and optics using straightforward language and everyday examples. This image is the frontispiece from her textbook, A Compendious System of Astronomy, published in 1799. Through much of the 1800s, women in the US and Europe enjoyed few legal, social, or political rights. They could not vote, could not sue or be sued, could not testify in court, had extremely limited control of the personal property after marriage, were rarely granted legal custody of their children in cases of divorce, and were barred from institutions of higher education. Women were expected to remain subservient to their fathers and husbands. It is amazing then that women were nevertheless able to establish and expand their entrepreneurial pursuits beyond the scope of intergenerational caretakers in sectors of the economy traditionally viewed as unfeminine. These women used the measure of financial success that they achieved as a platform to participate in economic, philanthropic, and political spheres. Here are a few of these determined women. Sojourner Truth, feminist and abolitionist Sojourner Truth was one of the towering figures of 19th century America. She was born into slavery in 1797 on a rural farm in Ulster County, New York. At age 30, she drew strength from her Christian faith and found the courage to escape with her infant daughter. Between 1863 and 1875, Truth had at least 14 different photographic portraits made. She sold them to provide income for herself. Her to visite and cabinet cards, like this one, taken in 1864, were portable and far cheaper to produce than copies of her narrative, featured next to her image on this slide. She controlled every aspect of the way she was depicted in these images. Gentile in cap and shawl, often with her knitting, a book or photograph in her lap, obscuring her disabled right hand. The caption on the image was written by Truth. It reads, I sell the shadow to support the substance. Number two, Harriet Wilson, our nig, or sketches from the life of a free black in a two-story white house north, showing that slavery, sh slavery shadow all even here, is the first novel written by an African-American and published in the United States in 1859. Wilson wrote it to raise funds to care for her sick son, George, and published it anonymously. The story recounts the oppression of free Blacks as indentured servants in the North. Wilson herself had been indentured until the age of 18 as a house servant. Arnig was the only novel she ever wrote. Number three, Emily Faithful. A photograph of publisher Emily Faithful in the 1870s, who dedicated her career to fighting for women's right to work. She wrote extensively on the issue and established the Victoria Press for the employment of women in 1860. The press and its goal of women's employment in the printing trade was a controversial labor and class issue at the time. The press's early business was contract printing for organizations aligned with its mission. Faithful traveled extensively in America publishing her book, Three Visits to America, documenting her observations of working women throughout the United States. Martha Maxwell, a photograph of naturalist Martha Maxwell in 1877, who brought Western fauna into public view through her skills in taxidermy. She defined the art of creating natural history dioramas with, with the animals displayed in their natural habitats. An aspiring scientist, she left Oberlin College for lack of money and journeyed west to join the gold rush. 
To support her work and her family, Maxwell established a museum and charged admission. Her Rocky Mountain Museum first opened in Boulder in 1874 and moved to Denver the following year. Maxwell was invited to show her work in the Colorado Building at the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia in 1876. Her display was one of the most popular at the internationally attended event. So many people asked whether the displays could have been done by a woman that she put up a sign reading women's work. Maxwell shot, trapped, and prepared all of her own specimens, noting that, quote, the demands, the world demands proof of women's capabilities. I couldn't imagine being with you all today in celebration of the Burwell School without showing a few items related to students. Number one, schoolgirl Emma Lascal's beautiful, beautifully observed and sensitively drawn cosmography report from the 1820s summarizes the astronomical knowledge of her day. 19th century advances in the telescope resulted in a heightened popular interest in astronomy across Europe. Lascal, a student at the convent of Notre Dame in Paris, created this manuscript for her Deuxième Place. She illustrates the phases of the moon, the heavenly constellations, and a comparison of Ptolemaic and Copernican systems. Number two, the National Female Schools of Ireland were founded in 1835 to teach girls from poor families respectable trades and skills. This book, called Simple Directions, was intended as a teaching aid for courses on sewing, darning, knitting, and embroidery. Descriptive text arranged by level of difficulty is followed with examples of 35 techniques hand sewn by the students in the schools. Simple Directions was published in several editions starting in 1835. And number three, a photograph of fourth grade students and their teacher at Roach Street School, an African American school in Atlanta in 1896. The Michael and Karen Stone Family Gallery, adjacent to the Biddle Room, featured items in the collection documenting a number of social movements, especially American and British suffrage, as well as the settlement, anti-lynching, and labor movements of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The Virginia Woolf desk was and still is in that room as well. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, wage work for women blossomed. The culture of professionalism grew and new industries were forged. The country's economic scales, started to shift from small agriculture and sales towards big business, banking, and major retail. World War I, as well as the 1918 flu pandemic, caused a worker shortage, necessitating that women take jobs outside the home in unprecedented numbers. As women filled workplace roles previously held by men, they also began to demand equal pay for their work. Gaining greater economic power and participating in more community decision-making, women increasingly advocated for their rights including the right to vote. Unable to deny the critical roles women played in society, politicians and others soon argued that they should be enfranchised. Many women who fought for suffrage participated in a range of other social reform movements as well. The Bassing Collection has a particularly deep body of material documenting the contributions of women like those on the next several slides. It's very timely to share these items as we commemorate the centenary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment in August 20, 1920, giving most American women the right to vote. Number one, an 1861 photograph of abolitionist and suffragist Lucretia Mott. Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were delegates to the 1840 World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. Female delegates were not allowed to participate in the convention and were relegated to the balcony. Some men, male delegates, including William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass, sat with them in solidarity. After the convention, Stanton and Mott began to lay the groundwork for the first Women's Rights Convention, which took place in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. And number two, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony first met in 1851 at an anti-slavery meeting in Seneca Falls. Stanton was one of the leading philosophers of suffrage and human rights, while Anthony organized volunteers and directed the campaigns. When their efforts to have women's suffrage included in the 14th and 15th Amendments failed, they established the National Women's Suffrage Association in 1869. In this portrait, Stanton is wearing a dress with a pattern of chains, a powerful symbol that was adopted by both the anti-slavery and women's suffrage movements. Number three, sashes and pins from about 1900 to 1915. Sashes were ubiquitous during the suffrage parades and demonstrations in the U.S. and Britain. Large groups of women wearing sashes, white dresses, and hats made a powerful visual statement about public support for votes for women. 
but activists could wear them at any time and for any occasion. This sash is in the yellow of the American Women's Suffrage Party. The Bassin Collection also includes a wide selection of American and British suffrage pins. The black and gold Votes for Women button was the most widely used design in the United States. Also included in the exhibit were pins for Catholic, Welsh, and men's organizations. In addition to pins, goods promoting the cause included badges, ribbons, jewelry, and even mechanical pencils. American and British activists borrowed designs from each other and adapted, adapted them as needed. And number four, an issue of the Suffragette newspaper from 1913, edited by British suffrage leader Christabel Pankhurst. Christabel was the old, oldest daughter of Emmeline Pankhurst, the founder of the British suffrage organization, the Women's Social and Political Union. And number five, this Vote Yes poster was printed and hung in theaters to get out the vote for the suffrage referenda held in Massachusetts, New York and Pennsylvania on November 2nd, 1915. Here are some examples of women and their creative output in the service of a range of political and social reforms. Number one, a teacup and saucer from the Hall House Kilns around 1927. In 1889, reformer Jane Addams and bookbinder Ellen Gates Starr founded the Hall House Social Settlement in an immigrant neighborhood in Chicago. Hull House members provided English classes, art clubs, kindergarten libraries, and activities for the neighborhood and for the neighborhood and work for social reform. Hull House Kilns was a commercial pottery associated with their art school. Many of the staff and potters were recent Mexican immigrants. The collection holds four teacups with matching saucers and a small serving bowl. All are stamped Hull House Kilns, Chicago. Number two, in this 1907 volume of poetry entitled Prejudice Unveiled and Other Poems, activist poet Lizelia Moore, a teacher at South Carolina's first black college, presents a sweeping portrayal of the nature of racial oppression. She noted that white writers misrepresented the experience of African Americans in the South and set out to tell the quote, unvarnished truth. She confronts lynching, debt payments, rape, segregation, and the hypocrisy of the church. The frontispiece may be the first depiction of an African-American woman with a typewriter. Number three, Bill Sweetley Association Annual Report for the year 1923. Jane and the Hunter founding, founded the Working Girls Association in 1911, changing the name to the Phyllis Wheatley Association in 1912. She sought to provide support and vocational training for single African-American women migrating to Cleveland from the South. Her own negative experience as a Black woman moving from South Carolina and attempting to find a safe place to set up residence and work as a nurse inspired her to establish the association. Hunter graduated from the Cleveland Law School in 1925 and continued to serve as the association's executive director until 1947. Number four, Russian immigrant and anarchist Emma Goldman dedicated her life to combating inequality, repression, and the exploitation of workers. She believed in direct action to bring about revolutionary change. First published in 1910 under Goldman's Mother Earth imprint, this collection of essays reveals the range of issues in which Goldman was active. It includes essays on labor, suffrage, free love, the modern school movement, political violence, and patriotism. The photograph next to the book is a particularly rare image of Goldman. The Trent Room, just next door to the Stone Gallery, was constructed to honor Dr. Josiah Charles Trent and the donation of his remarkable historical medical collection by his wife, Mary Duke Biddle Trent Siemens. The room, which has existed in two previous locations at Duke before being rebuilt in the Rubenstein Library, includes one case for rotating exhibits. The images on this slide show the case, that case during the Baskin exhibit. It featured women in the history of medicine, medical education, and medical careers from the 17th to the 20th centuries. They range from 17th century midwives, to the first women doctors in the 19th century, to 20th century birth control advocates who created the first women's clinics. Number one, Louise Bourgeois, who turned to midwifery to support her family while her surgeon husband served in the army, became official midwife for the French court for 26 years. Her most famous patient was Marie de Medici, Queen of France and second wife of Francis Henry IV. Her 1609 book, the first observations on sterility, depicted here in the slide, was the first work on obstetrics to be published by a woman and was based on observations of over 2,000 deliveries. 
It was translated into Dutch, German, and English, underscoring the breadth of Bourgeois' reputation across Europe. Among her other achievements and contributions, Bourgeois' methods were trans transformational in helping to alleviate the pain, fear, and mortality of childbirth. Number two, Quaker Mary J. Scarlett graduated from the Women's College of Pennsylvania in 1857 and became professor of anatomy at the college in 1862. She practiced amongst the poor and gave lectures on hygiene and health in rural communities. Because hospitals at, at this time were not open to women for purposes of instruction, the Women's Medical College opened the Women's Hospital of Philadelphia in 1861. Scarlett served as resident physician at the hospital until 1871. This poster, advertising a lecture by Scarlett, is from 1858. Number three, Margaret Sanger's socialism and feminism were born of her own experience growing up in a family of 11 children. She noted in her memoir, My Fight for Birth Control, that, quote, very early in my childhood, I associated poverty, toil, unemployment, drunkenness, cruelty, quarreling, fighting, deaths, and jails with large families. Sanger worked as a nurse in the New York City slums and began to challenge the federal laws that prohibited the distribution of birth control information. This copy of Family Limitation is one of 100,000 in the first edition published in 1914. Sanger opened the first family planning clinic in the U.S. in 1916. In 1952, she joined with other advocates for family planning and founded the International Planned Parenthood Federation. And number four, sponges have been in use for contraceptive purposes for centuries. Modern forms of contraceptive sponge were popularized in the West during the birth control movement of the early 20th century. In Family Limitation, Margaret Sanger recommended their use for effective birth control. The sanitary health sponge, likely manufactured in Illinois in the 19-teens, sits inside of a pink, of pink netting enclosed in this brightly colored tin. Margaret, excuse me. The exhibit, which was at Duke from February to June last year, traveled to the Grolier Club in New York City in December and remained there until mid-February this year. The Duke and Grolier Club shows received nearly 12,000 visitors. The shows, the catalog, the online exhibit, and the collection as a whole have attracted considerable attention from the media as well. New York Times writer Jennifer Schistler observed in her review of the exhibition at the Grolier Club that in her collecting, quote, Ms. Baskin spiraled backward and outward, assembling a kaleidoscopic record of women both arguing for their rights and simply going about their business. And in her recent National Geographic article, Michelle Norris called the collection, quote, the world's largest record of women in work and professional enterprise. By bringing together materials from across the centuries, the Lisa Unger Baskin collection reveals what has been hidden that women have long pursued a startling range of careers and vocations, and that through their work, they have supported themselves, their families, and the causes they believed in. The collection makes the true breadth of women's contributions visible. What has been eclipsed is being illuminated. The future is female, and so was the past. Thank you. I'm gonna stop share right now. But you'll see that the online the, the link for the online exhibit is on this slide, and I'm happy to put it in the uh, chat as well. Laura, thank you so much. I that is a unbelievable exhibit, and you exhibit. have done so much working with it. Thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions, so. If you're good to jump right in, we can do that. Um, and I think one of the one of the questions that's a good way to start is, I was going to say, what is um, what are some of your favorite pieces from the collection, or do you have a favorite? Um, yeah. How does it work? Because it's a lot to look at. It is. It's eighteen thousand items. So how could one choose? So I can say after. Um, <laughs> been working on this project for about eight years, five of those years since the collection came to Duke. So um, what I think my experience has been, what I know my experience has been, is that every different week, every different month, I have a, I have a new favorite. Um, I have a new hero is how we think of it. Um, in fact, we thought about putting together a podcast, a series of podcasts, or a, another web exhibit um, about our heroes, because there are so many heroes in this collection, so many that um, for one of the presentations I gave some years ago, it, it, it occurred to me that I should quote um, 
you know, a very famous woman uh, in, in um, office today and say that uh, the, the Bassing Collection is filled with women who persisted. Nevertheless, they persisted. So I showed uh, uh, works from a number of the women that I talked about today and talked about how they persisted against every different kind of barrier um, during their lifetimes. And so really it's, it's about all of the different, uh, all of the different heroes that that, uh, that have been unfolded and revealed to me through the collection. But I think I, you know, I'm particularly excited, to, as most people are, I think, probably in the room today, by people like um, Sojourner Truth and Louise de Bourgeois. Those are two, two, and and uh, Maria de Spilla Marion. Those are some of my favorites. Fantastic. And we actually have a question about one of the slides that you shared. Um, and it's about Phyllis Wheatley. And the question is, can you tell us more about the slide and why the Star of David was used? The Star of David was used? Um, I'm not sure of the answer to that question. Um, I really not. I can say that the book is fascinating. Um, a couple things I didn't mention about the book are uh, that she signed it, um, her signature is on it, Phil's Wheatley signature, but also the signature of a person called Melatia Bentz, uh, who owned the book and who was a tavern keeper. And if you could see the book in person, you would see that it's um, it's stitched together by hand in a very homespun way, not in a you know fancy professional library conservator way, but stab stitched um, to hold it together. And the reason that we kept it like that and didn't change that homespun um, fix is that we thought it was a particularly moving example of, of how important the book was to its owner. A tavern keeper in the 18th century uh, probably only owned a book or two if they owned any books at all. So it was so important to her and she read it so often um, that she needed to sew it back together again. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Amazing copy. That's like the version of my scotch taped together book from right. when I was the, the pressure precious. Born to you. Precious. <laughs> yes. Um, and speaking of books, do you know of a book that provides an overview of the contributions of women over the years? Oh my, well, I consulted a number of them <laughs> to, to um, put together my talks over the years, but normally, um, you know, there are some, but few, but normally scholars sort of focus on one time period. So early modern women, for example, and, you know, women in the Renaissance or 19th century women or 18th century entrepreneurs. Um, that was, I looked at a book about 18th century entrepreneurs that I thought was particularly cool as I was, um, as I was putting this talk together. So really it, it tends to be, you know, a, or a focus on a particular geographic period. Um, so I, there are very few books that sort of take in the whole suite, which is great. One of the reasons for that is that you can't, that's more than a book, right? It's many, many, many books. That's what the passing collection shows. Oh, right. Absolutely. Um, some of the other questions that we have focus a little bit more on the impact of the collection itself, like in the, um, particularly at Duke, but how, how has the faculty used this collection to teach and how has it impacted that piece? Oh, that's a lovely question. Thank you. Um, so the collection has been used by faculty uh, from its very earliest days at, at Duke. You know, we sort of um, catalog and use it almost in real time, which is it, itself an extremely significant challenge. Um, and so we, there have been a number of, of, you know, sort of really profound uses by people like Tom Robichaud in the history department, Jenna Miller in the, um, in the economics department, uh, and others, um, uh, Seth Lejac in the writing program. So. Tom has taught with the collection now many, many times in the Duke Focus course, um, which is a more sort of deeply engaged um, course with undergraduate students focused on women and magic and um, early modern Europe. Um, Jenna Miller uh, works with the, the collection in the context for women in the economy class, uh, which, and from the beginning, as I say, and last fall, we took a huge uh, parts of the collection and, and uh, incorporated them into uh, a semester long engagement, which were 38 students who curated, who helped us curate our, um, our suffrage centenary exhibit, which is gonna go up as an online exhibit next month and as a physical exhibit, I hope in 2021. So, and then Seth Lejock, one of my favorites, he worked with students in the history of uh, women in Western medicine and they actually created um, they, they took, they used uh, facsimiles from the collection, which were meaningful to them and created posters uh, 
that, that annotated with their own views and thoughts and ideas about what the, the, the materials meant. And that was particularly gratifying to see. And the students just love it. They oh. seem to really react very powerfully to it. My favorite sweet story is a, of a young um, undergraduate student, a woman who said that whenever she has writer's block or otherwise feels like she's lacking confidence, she comes to see our permanent exhibit of the Virginia Woolf Writing Desk, and it inspires her to keep on keeping on. That is fantastic. It's cool. great that, that even people can just find different ways to be inspired from this collection. There kind of is something for everyone and every thing that they're looking to do. So that's wonderful. Um, and so why was Duke chosen? To hold this collection? So Duke was chosen for a number of reasons. It's a great story which starts uh, eight years ago when my boss, Andy Armacost, who before he came into academia was part of the antiquarian book trade, um, was stuck at an airport with Lisa and her Baskin's son, also a member of the antiquarian book trade. They were coming back across the country from I think either a conference or a book fair. They got stuck in Texas, in an in a airport in Texas, had a very long layover, and at that point, the existence of the Lisa Baskin collection, which was in her home, was an open secret in the trade and in, the, in their book and manuscript circles. Andy knew about it and said to Hosey Baskin, um, so what is your mother thinking about doing with the collection? And then told him the story of the Sally Bingham Center, which I direct, and um, asked him if there was any possibility that they, we could continue the conversation. And Hosey said, oh, yes, mother is thinking about putting her collection somewhere. She's quite concerned because... The weather has been bad where she lives in Western Massachusetts. The snow is making the roofs cave in and electrical storms are causing fires and so forth. And she lives in an old wooden farmhouse where the collection was stored and she's quite concerned. Um, and she feels like she wants it to be in an institution where more people can have access to it and where it can be safe. And so that's, that started a three year conversation which involved um, many of us going up to visit Lisa and her family and a number of them coming down to visit us and then we were invited along with a handful of other schools to um, create a proposal uh, and which described literally every dimension of what we would do with the collection from document from uh, describing it to providing access to it in the classroom and everything in between public programming and so forth exhibits. Um, and we submitted our proposal along with uh, some pretty significant um, famous institutions and ours was chosen. So in April 2015, the collection came to us, but the, the family had, did not have a previous connection to Duke. Not, no alums or any of those usual connections. It was, all, it was all in the proposal and in the relationship building. I don't want to minimize that. Wow. Yeah, and I also want to give special credit to Esther Terry, whose name might ring a bell with people because she was the, she's the retired president of Bennett College in Greensboro. Uh, she is Lisa Baskin's very best friend, and she was instrumental in, in, in the process, too. Extraordinary uh, scholar of color. Very. Um, well, how, how does having this collection impact being able to attract other collections, um, either ones that complement it, or I imagine this is a pretty prestigious collection to have. So how does that it's make been, a difference for you guys? It's been wonderful and um, exciting. So one of the things that it's inspired is um, that other women collectors of rare materials uh, have approached us and seen that, that we do a pretty good job um, with this kind of work and that we have a deep um, commitment to women collectors, right? I mean, the rare book collections all over the country and all over the world um, in their early history were mostly built by male collectors donating their collections, right? So this is actually, um, you know, part of a, a, a an amazing sort of change in, in that status quo, not just at Duke, but in other places, and not just in the sense that collections are coming to us and we're drawing attention to the fact that women brought the collections together, but um, the media is really having a field day with um, women as collectors. There's all kinds of articles out there now about women as collectors, so it's, and, and um, contests and so forth, very cool. So, um, yeah, so that, that has been a growing thing, but also uh, every single antiquarian dealer of every single different kind of rare book and manuscript has all of a sudden come out with a women's list starting in about the fall of, 20, of uh, 2015. And I get women's lists every week, all the time, 
Um, so it's very interesting because many of them are dealers who have never sold women's materials before. So it's been really, really interesting. I've been doing this kind of work for over 20 years. So it's very interesting to see in 2015, all of a sudden, this massive interest. And it's been great. Part of our work is to build, keep building on the collection. So, you know, there have been some amazing materials that we've, we've been able to add um, as a result of this groundswell of, of interest. Um, yeah. Very cool. And we actually, if you'll excuse me, as I look in the chat here for a minute, um, we have some people commenting on that. Um, one participant is saying that her sister-in-law has a significant collection of books related to and by feminists in the suffrage movement. And um, how, how do we keep encouraging women to share their collections in places like um, the Sally Bingham collection? Like, how do we do that and, and continue to encourage her? It kind of sounds like starting with what happened with the Lisa Baskin collection, it, it became more on the forefront. Yeah, but I mean, I, I'm looking at the question too. So, um, how do we how to go from here? So, if this collection, which sounds wonderful, by the way, uh, Sherry, if I may call you Sherry, um, you know, if if this is a collection that she wants to make available to scholars, I would very much urge her to talk uh, to her local, you know, university or college librarian, um, and and consider putting it in an institution, or to talk to me. I'm very glad to talk to her. Uh, the you know suffrage and um, the suffrage movement and and feminism in general are deep areas of focus for the Bingham Center. So this could be you know could be wonderful addition to our collections. But um, and, yeah, so I just I encourage her to reach out and 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 talk to librarians and archivists about what she has and um, to make it available to to scholars because uh, I think it's really important that these collections are available to to students and to people to use them. That's one of the things that was was most exciting I think to scholars who already knew about the collection was that while Lisa was generous about inviting people to her home, it's not quite as easy to do research in somebody's home as it is a private home as right. it is in the library. So, you know, people were particularly excited to be able to come to our reading room and, and use the material. Absolutely. And then we also have a question. Are there any women who were either from or lived in North Carolina um, who are highlighted in the collection? Not a ton, a few. I think we do have a few North Carolina women. Um, so Lisa did the, uh, not that where you collect necessarily indicates um, the geographic location of the people who created the material, but nonetheless, Lisa has spent most of her life in um, the Northeast. She was born in Brooklyn, New York, um, spent most of her life in the Northeast, except for 10 years that she spent in England. And um, I think the bulk of the materials that she got or that are in the collection are uh, more British and um, continental European and uh, Northeastern, some Midwest and some Southern. But so one of the things that's so exciting, I thank you for asking the question, one of the things that's so exciting about this collection is that, um, so the Bingham Center is about 30-ish years old. Uh, when we started, there were already um, some major, major collections of 19th century American women in, in this country, suffrage collections and so forth, especially the, at Radcliffe, Harvard, the Spy Smith, and the Spy Smith collection at Smith, so Schlesinger and Spy Smith. So it didn't make sense for us in the middle 1980s to try to reinvent that wheel that they were already doing for a very long time very well, right? So, but one of the things we did do was to build um, up on our Southern suffrage collections. So now Lisa's incredibly exciting uh, world-class uh, Northeastern and British suffrage collections are in conversation with our su Southern suffrage collections, um, which are, are going to be, um, you know, just very vividly on offer in our suffrage exhibit that's going to go on online and be published on our website next month. So it's a wonderful sort of triangulation of her collections and ours. So while some of her collection um, of printed material docu uh, duplicates ours, it mostly doesn't. So it's been a very transformational collection for us. Oh, fantastic. Um, I can't wait for that exhibit to go up, by the way. I'm, I'm very so excited. excited too. <laughs> um, and I'll just ask really quickly, if anyone else has any questions, go ahead and add them into the chat. And Laura, do you want to mention, and I know right now we're in the world of COVID, where we're not doing things in public, but do you want to mention how if someone wants to come in, are there 
restrictions on this collection, what are some of the things that you can do at the center um, and at the Rubenstein Library if you want to go more in depth into some of these things? Thank you, uh, Carrie. So right now, as you say, in the world of COVID, our reading room is closed and it's going to be closed for the rest of the <laughs> summer. Um, about three quarters of the way through August, uh, we're going to have um, some afternoon hours by um, appointment, but those are only, to begin with, only for Duke faculty and students and staff. Um, just to reduce the density of people on campus really is, is what that's about. And if all goes well in Durham and North Carolina and the world, hopefully we will start to reopen again more broadly um, in the spring semester. But this collection is totally open um, and is not restricted, which is, which is great. And it is, um, you know, very much, it is not entirely 100% catalog, but, it, but we have gotten through much of it. There's a Lisa Unger Baskin um, website, which uh, will attach you to, to, on that website. I can put that in the chat in a minute too. Um, there's a piece at the bottom, which actually is a feed of all the most recently cataloged items and also a counter that tells you how many of the items have been cataloged. So it's, we are doing very well, <laughs> um, especially because <laughs> everything else we've been doing uh, in these years with the collection. Um, and, and you know, I just look forward to the time that we are back open and people can come and use it. Um, and Janie, uh, I don't have a website address yet for the suffrage exhibit, but I will be glad to, to send it to you guys as soon as I have it, if, you, if there's a way you can distribute it to folks. Absolutely, we will definitely take care of that. Um, well, Laura, I just can't thank you enough. I feel like we got to, to trace through the halls of the gallery and actually experience part of this um, with your presentation. And I'm just so thankful for that. Um, particularly since you can't be anywhere in public <laughs> right. right now. Um, so this was a great, I feel like I took a trip, even though I didn't leave my house. <laughs> Good. And, um, <laughs> and I would also like to thank everyone that attended today. We had some great, um, if you check the chat, we've had some folks that mentioned some books that they found helpful. Um, I love that aspect of this type of presentation because we can kind of all share information. So thank you for that. Um, I would encourage everyone, we do have an exhibit that is online right now at the Burwell School that we put together about um, women associated with the school and their work in education and business. So um, a huge shout out to all the folks that were a part of that. Um, please go to our website and check that out. Mm -hmm. And um, we also want you to be aware we have more programs coming, um, including our extremely popular star party, which Laura, I think you and your family would enjoy as well, um, <laughs> knowing you guys. Um, but we will be in touch. Um, if you check the website, keep up with Facebook. We're working on the format of that now in the world that we live in. So just definitely keep an eye. And once again, Laura, thank you so much for the time and energy you put into this. Um, it was a fabulous presentation, and I'm just so thankful we were able to share that with everyone today. So thank thanks you, Carrie, so much. Janie, and Kate. All right, and everyone have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.